Dear colleagues, in partnership with the Deutsche Gesellschaft for Nephrologie, the Österreichische Gesellschaft for Nephrologie, and the Société Francophone de Nephrologie, Dialyse et Transplantation, Marcus at Home welcomes Professor Juan Carlos Ajus in Houston, Texas, with whom we would like to discuss burning issues in the treatment of hyponatremia, stimulated by two very recent large cohort studies from Toronto, Canada, and Boston, Massachusetts. Both studies have been published in New England Journal of Medicine Evidence. Both question the hitherto existing standards from international guidelines that have recommended to raise plasma sodium only very slowly in hyponatremia. Dr. Jules is senior author of the Boston cohort study, and he has written the editorial to the Toronto cohort studies together with Dr. Michael Moritz. So, Professor Jules, we are very, very proud to host a legend in sodium research. Thanks for being with us. Dr. Jules is professor of medicine at the University of California, the Division of Nephrology in Irvine. For decades, he has been global leader in research on electrolyte disorders. And I guess he is one of the very few people who have published at least one New England Journal of Medicine paper each decade since the 70s of the last century. My co-moderators are Professor Markus Seemann, president of the Austrian Society of Nephrology, and for the first time at Markus at Home, Professor Gregor Lindner, who is head of the emergency department at the Kepler Klinikum in Linz, Austria. Yeah, good morning and good afternoon to my College in Germany and Austria uh, is a real honor to participate, and I would like to uh, present basically four cases that illustrate the drama, if you want to call it, of mistreatment or improper treatment or hyponatremia. These are real cases. They happen in academic centers in the United States, which I participated as a reviewer after the the bad outcome and will illustrate the problem. The learning objective is distinguish the various subtypes of hyponatremia and summarize the current evidence and best practice in the management of hyponatremia. We nephrologists know that the kidney is the key in terms of water abnormalities, that uh, retention of water will produce hyponatremia excretion of too much water and produce hyponatremia, but it's the brain who produce the neurologic abnormalities that alert the physicians that something has happened. I will focus on the brain, but I also focus in another abnormalities that we have recent have evidence that suggests that hyponatremia is a multi-system disease and affects many organs. Now, Clearly, in the normal conditions, the fluctuation of sodium is very, very low. In normal range, despite wide fluctuation of fluid intake, we maintain the sodium between 135 and 145. Why is that? Because of the tremendous capacity of the kidney to excrete water. In fact, if you Taking a normal individual, he can excrete up to 16 liters a day of fluid. It's almost impossible with somebody with normal renal function to become hyponatremic. And that's an important concept. In order for you to become hyponatremic, the kidneys have to have an impairment to excrete free water. And for the kidneys to impair free water, you're going to have to have in excess of ADH. With well, the concept, I want to tell the audience that hyponatremia is always, always, except in cases of severe glomerular impairment, is always associated with an impairment of free water excretion due to increased ADH activity. Now, <clears throat> what are the requirements for free water excretion? You need two. You need an increased solute and water delivery to the dilutic segment of the kidney, and you need suppression of ADH production. These two things need to be present in order for you to have an adequate water diuresis. For instance, 
If you have severe volume depletion and you have an increased proximal reabsorption and you give that individual hypotonic fluids, that individual will develop hyponatremia. But the same token, if you have an increased ADS production activity, either osmotic or non-osmotic, and you give hypotonic fluids, that individual will develop hyponatremia. That means these two areas is important to understand the requirement of free water distribution. Now, how do we measure quantity of renal water distribution? In the past, we used to uh, measure this as osmolar cleavance. However, we know that the osmolarity in the urine include urea, and urea is not a good mechanism for translocation of water across the cell. And because of that, electrofluid water clearance has been the measure to measure water discretion. And we can simply measure sodium in the urine plus potassium in the urine. And if that is less of the plasma sodium, you will have a positive raise in plasma sodium. If the urine sodium plus urine potassium is less than the plasma sodium, you will have a negative and you will lower the plasma sodium. What I'm trying to tell you is this is very useful when you see a patient at bedside to check the electrolytes in the urine and to give you an idea if the patient is having a water diuresis or the patient is an antidiuresis. Having this uh, introduction, basic main, main physiology, let's talk about the non-osmotic stage of arginine vasopressin. This is a paper that we wrote to the New England in 2015 to illustrate that when a patient comes to the hospital that is subject to hemodynamic stimuli and non-hemodynamic stimuli for ADS secretion. And look what happened. All the things that can happen to somebody who come to the hospital. Could be volume depletion, hypotension, congestive heart failure, cirrhosis, nephrotic syndrome, adrenal insufficiency, but non-hemodynamic stimulus are extremely more common. And I just want to mention nausea and vomiting is probably the most potent stimuli for ADH production. In other words, if you have somebody postoperative who has a tremendous amount of nausea and vomiting and you give hypotonic fluid, that's a perfect setup for water retention. Medication, especially in the elderly, antidepressant medication, inflammation. We have now clear evidence that inflammation is a production to interleukin-6 of ADH. That means patients with COVID have been reported to have significant increase of hyponatremia. What I'm trying to tell you is when you see a patient in the hospital, all these potential factors make the patient susceptible to water retention in case of patient receiving inappropriate IV fluids. Now, this is the classical equation of Isidoro Hedelman, which was one of my mentors at the University of California, San Francisco. He took uh, about 165 patients at San Francisco General, this was in the 60s, and did it uh, isotopic studies measure exchangeable sodium, exchangeable potassium divided by total body water, and he calculated that that relationship correlated with the plasma sodium. There's a combination of three factors that can lead to hyponatremia. Excess water injection, sodium loss, but the key factor here is inability to excrete free water. Again, excess water ingestion and the presence of normal renal function will not produce hyponatremia. You need an impairment of free water. Now, let's talk about other cases. Hyponatremia, I like to divide it in hospital acquired hyponatremia, the hyponatremia that usually result as if something happened to the hospital, and the outpatient, the patient who comes with hyponatremia to the hospital. And let's start with this. This is the first case, real case, 
A 32-year-old white female admitted to a university teaching hospital for elective hysterectomy. Past medical history, unremarkable, except, and I want to mention this, recurrent migraine headaches. Patient has history of headaches. And I, I, it's going to become pertinent later. Physical examination was not revealing. Everything was normal. It's a normal person coming for an electrosurgery. Patient underwent abdominal hysterectomy and bled profusely during surgery. In the postoperative period, the patient is studying D5 quarter normal saline with 10 millipurians potassium chloride at 125 cc per hour. Demerol 75 for pain, Phenergan 25 for nausea. 16 hour postoperatively. She was awake and alert in the room, but complained of nausea. Vomited once and was treated with Phenergan. 24 hour postoperatively. She complained of severe prefrontal headache. Remember, this patient has history of migraines and was said, well, this is the same problem. Continued to have nausea and vomiting and was treated with additional doses of Demerol and Phenergan. Now, 36 hours, she's in the room with a family and the husband. These are, she, she, she's a, an accountant, she's a very intelligent person. And the husband report, report to the physician that the wife has stole, just stopped breathing. Like brief family I spelled, the residents come, she, is confused and combative. Now the physical examination of the welded temperature is 100. Blood pressure, which was normal at the admission, is now 160 over 90. She is bradycardic at 60. She has an isochoria, no rigidity, but no odor. She is a sick person at that time. Well, the calm everything. They do all the labs, panesodium 119, potassium 3.8, chloride 84, CO2 25, beyond 4, that's a need to nephrology, creatinine 0.6, glucose 92, they even do a uric acid, xenon osmolaris is 250, it's a true hyposmolar hyponatremia, urine osmolaris is 625, but look at the arterial blood gases. She has a pH of 7.34. The PO2, she's epoxic, the 57, PCO2 48, and the chest airway show pulmonary edema with normal wedge. And this is the real case. Now, who sees this patient? Not a nephrology, you know, NS4 and platelet monsters. The seeing bar, a critical care individual and a neurology. Both prominent members of the community who basically said the critical care guy said, Oh, this is obviously a pulmonary emboli, postoperative. And the neurologist said, No, 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 no. This patient has a history of migraines and the postoperative period, she probably bled and is a bleeding. The southern 119 has been totally disregarded. Nobody pays attention. And this is the x-ray, normal heart, pulmonary edema. And now, I do every year the review board for Harvard. I always give this, and I give you the choice. OK, you give 100 cc or 10% hypertonic saline. With that evidence, you give a 1,000 cc of normal saline. You send the patient for brain imaging, or you call a nephrologist. Well, things have changed over the years. Many people now will agree with 1,000 cc, uh, 100 cc hypertonic saline. But unfortunately for this patient, she was sent for brain imaging. The ICU is in the 10th floor. The neuro imaging is in the basement. They put a patient in a gurney and through elevator, 
This is what happened. A CT scan was ordered by the resident and it wrote to the X-ray department, the patient has a seizure and a respiratory arrest. Pupil were fixed and dilated. Six hours later, the urine output increased to 300 cc per hour. The urine osmolality fell to 60. Serum sodium rose spontaneously to 164. What is this? This is central diabetes insipidus, secondary to ischemia of the hypothesis, as a result of the massive cerebral edema. Patient is part 24 hours later. Autopsy show ankle herniation, intact basal artery, nothing, no massive cerebral edema, patent pulmonary arteries. And these, my distinguished colleagues, this is the face of hyponatremic encephalopathy in a young female. And if you see one case in your life, it's nothing more striking. Because as you can see in America, you pay for these cases. Because the lawyer will call you, will request the charge, and I can tell you when I reviewed this case, I told the committee, go call the insurance company and write the check. Can defend these cases. Because this is a healthy person who came to the hospital for an elective surgery and is dead. And is dead because two things. Number one, why this patient develop hyponatremia? And the second question is, are females more susceptible to this condition? Now, this is handling. It's easy. Anybody who has taken care of patient postoperatively will tell you that nausea is a prominent. Well, nausea is a very potent stimulant for ADH. Now, all these mechanisms, all these narcotics will not produce hyponatremia unless you give hypotonic fluids. And this is the key. This is what people tend to forget, that if you, in a postoperative state, give hypotonic fluid, the end result will be fluid retention. And why is that? This is a study we done several years ago. We never published that. But we took patients and we measured ADH. This is a preparation. It's already up. But look what happened in hours. Two hours, 20 hours, 44 hours, 50 hours. ADH is up. Means ADH increased significantly after surgery. And if in that setting, you give hypotonic fluids, it's only one thing is going to happen. You're going to have a tank water. And this is clearly when you calculate the amount of free intake and the relief and the change in serum sodium. It's almost a linear relationship. Now, are female more susceptible to these conditions? Well, this is a study that we did in 1992. We published in the Annals of Internal Medicine. And my idea was, after seeing many of these cases, are female more susceptible to this condition because they are females. And in order to do that, we took all the cases uh, at Methodist Hospital, surgical cases, and we find out that when this patient developed hyponatremia, they were almost half and half. Men were not, female were no more common develop hyponatremia than men. However, when you look at the cases with brain damage, it was a significant difference between females and males. That means if you develop hyponatremia and you're a female, you have chance of develop brain damage significantly higher than males. And if you are a female and you are a premenopausal female, means a younger female, you have significant more risk of death than a postmenopausal female. Even so, postmenopausal are also at risk, but less than premenopausal. Now, in order to convince the reviewers, the editor asked me the question, are females more susceptible of death regardless what is the serum sodium 
of the rapidity of hyponatremia. And this, and green is woman, and orange is men. And you can see that any time that the hyponatremia is less than 24 hours, more than 24 hours, serum sodium less than 115 or more. If you are a female, you are a significant more risk of developing brain damage of that. Well, is this is, 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 is a biblical uh, condemnation or something? No. The evidence is to, in the ability of the brain of the female to adapt to hypotomicity. And in order to do that, we took in the animal model astrocytes. Astrocytes are cells in the brain that protect the neurons for swelling. In other words, rather than the, the neurons to swell, the astrocyte through aquaporin receptors regular water. And we did the study, we measured astrocyte volume, which at that time we give it volume 100, and we incubated the astrocyte with estrogens. And look what happened. Like a swell, like a balloon. When you put testosterone, they return to a normal level. I don't recommend that you give testosterone to people to prevent that, but this illustrates the issue of the role of estrogen in sodium inhibition in brain adaptation. Estrogen inhibits sodium ATPs, and it's clearly one of the most top, important inhibitors of the pump. Now, when you measure cerebral perfusion also in hyponatremia, you can see that if you are a female, you have more hypoperfusion with hyponatremia compared to male. Now, when you put these two together, you have now the pathogenesis, why females are more susceptible to breast damage. Inhibition of cere cerebral sodium, potassium, ATPs activity by estrogen with an impaired ability of the brain cell to extrude sodium and initial cell volume defense. Remember, the initial defense of the volume and hyponatremia of cerebral edema is the ability of the brain to extrude sodium. If you inhibit that because the sodium ATPs is impaired, well, you have less ability to decrease cerebral edema. And if in addition, you have vasoconstriction of the cerebral blood vessel by vasopressin, you have now a decrease in hypoperfusion with also impaired. That is the animal evidence and the pathogenesis of why females are more susceptible. Now, what are the key points? How do we avoid these catastrophes? The key point is simple. It's the prevention of the avoidance of hypotonic fluids. If you, if the audience remember that, I think I did my job. And I want to also mention something. You know, there's a lot of new uh, uh, people like to use now uh, balanced solutions. And in the state, we are seeing now in epidemics because the anesthesiologist friend are using ringer lactate. Well, I'm going to tell you something. Ringer lactate is a hypothermic solution. Sodium concentration 130. And if you give enough Ringer lactate to a postoperative patient, you will end having hyponatremia. The solution of choice should be sodium, normal saline, which has a concentration of sodium, which is equal to the aqueous phase of the capillary, means 154. Now, the other important point in these cases is the nausea, vomiting, and headache in a postoperative patient, especially in a young female, should be alert for the possibility of hyponatremic encephalopathy and immediate electrolyte should be checked because that is the problem that I see over and over. The patient is after surgery. They think it's anesthesia, the problem. Well, checking the electrolyte will take 30 minutes, and you can be sure that you're not dealing with hyponatremic encephalopathy. Now, 
Fluids can provide benefits. Fluids can cause harm. I think uh, if I don't know if the residents are listening to this conference, fluids are drugs. The same thing that we do when we give an antibiotics and we measure and we give it the appropriate doses. Well, remember this lady was given 125 cc per hour. Why are you gonna give 125 cc per hour to everybody? They still see it after surgery, the spring orders. This should be completely avoided. Each individual patient should be given each individual IV fluids. Now, let's move to the outpatient. Another case, this is the mother of the chief of staff of the University Teaching Hospital. 75 year old female with a history of high blood pressure and medicated, not to see the, the son. And the son is a good physician, but you never treat your family. That's, and he decides, check the blood pressure, oh, you're a little bit, we're gonna put you in a 25 milligram of hydrochlorothiazide daily. Now, when she takes this medication, she reports to the son that she's become thirsty. And she, and the son said, oh, well, if you become thirsty, takes water, takes, need to take water. That's, that's how he recommends water. Now, the patient goes now, and after it began through this, to the neurology clinic for a year for gait abnormalities. This is a patient who used to, uh, you love, love to dance and uh, can't dance anymore because she can't walk very well. And she's the prominent family, uh, son is a physician, chief of staff, everybody's worried. What is she having trouble walking and occasion of falls. Now, she lived alone, fell at home, had a hip fracture, and she underwent surgery. Within 72 hours, she has a massive pulmonary emboli and that. Okay, this is, this is the history. And, and, and you say, well, what, what is anything to do with hyponatremia? Well, let me tell you what. When, we, when I look the case, the only laboratory normality in the preceding year was a serum sodium ranging between 132 and 129. That's it, that's the only thing. And the question I'm gonna to pose to everybody is, can a sodium 132 or 129 result in gait abnormality like seeing in these patients? Can somebody with hyponatremia have trouble walking? And I wanna discuss the following issues. Can bone abnormalities be a consequence of chronic hyponatremia? Is there any association between fractures and chronic hyponatremia? Do we have the evidence? Is hyponatremia associated with gait disturbance? But what mechanism does hyponatremia affect the bone? Now, again, this is a paper that we published in JAMA, 1999, very interesting history. We send the paper. Uh, several reviews, and one, and and this is the sequela of chronic hyponatremia. These are all people with chronic encephalopathy. But look what happened. This is about twenty percent of people at presentation has an orthopedic injury. Now, when I send this paper, one of the reviewers said this doesn't make sense. I want the, you to remove this. The editor, which was very, said, no, 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 leave it. I didn't know why this happened, but it was a, fa a feature. And basically, subsequent to that, there are at least 30 studies in the literature. This is to show an association between chronic hyponatremia and fractures. That's clearly established. But what is more important, this is from Dr. Rodenberg, who is from Belgium, has a magnificent paper in the American Journal of Medicine 2006, which clearly indicates 
that falls as a common symptom of chronic asymptomatic hyponatremia and falls produce high fracture. Exactly what happened to this lady. And the mortality for heat fracture in the first year is 36%. Most cancers don't have that mortality. It's a bad disease in the elderly. Now, this is a study that we published in MDT several years ago showing that mild hyponatremia, when you do the FRAX analysis, hyponatremia is worse than anything but other fractures. That means if you have chronic hyponatremia, the chance for you to develop key fracture is very high. Now, is hyponatremia associated with gait disturbance exactly what happened to this lady? And again, Dr. Ronneman clearly demonstrated that if you have even mild hyponatremia, 130, look what happened with the gait. It's like you're drunk. Look, this is, this is a great study. Look what happened. And when you correct the hyponatremia, everything goes. That means either you drink a good Malbec and you got this gait, or you become hyponatremic. Yeah, you drink got Malbec, at least you enjoy life. But if you're hyponatremic, you fell and you broke your hip. Now, what are the mechanisms that produce hyponatremia problems in the bone? And these are studies by my colleague, Dr. Joe Bervalis, published, this is animal and rats, and look what happened. In the rats with normal sodium is normal bone mineralization. If you have hyponatremia, the bone became totally osteoporotic. And that is what happened. If you have chronic hyponatremia, you have two mechanisms independent of each other to have problems. One, the CNN impairment, you have anesthetic gait, confusion, lethargy, and fall. And the other, you have a fragile bone, osteoporosis. You have a fragile. The combination of a fall and fragile bones result in heat fracture, and that is a serious, preventable problem in the elderly with hyponatremia. And again, the key point is that fractures, heat fracture in particular, could be the initial presentation of chronic hyponatremia, especially in female. Female gender, age greater than 60 years of age, use of diuretics and selected serotonin reuptake inhibitors, history of smoking and osteoporosis are significant risk factors. And more important, in the ER, when a patient presented with hip fracture, please always evaluate for hyponatremia. Now, just a wording about elderly taking diuretics. When you have an elderly, especially taking a tazai, and you have an increase in fur, these are the people that are at great risk for the development of symptomatic hyponatremia. What do I do when I put somebody in a diuretic, especially in a tazan? I tell him to come to, you know, 48 hours later, and I see how do they respond with weight loss. If they lose weight, which is what you expect, I'm okay. But if the weight is stable or they gain weight, this is a group of patients who will develop hyponatremia. And you need to watch it very, very carefully, especially with tazan. Chronic symptomatic hyponatremia can be associated with significant morbidity related to fall and other orthopedic injuries as exemplified by this patient. Now, let's move to something else. How many of the audience think that somebody who presents to the emergency room with pulmonary edema only, we should rule out hyponatremia? I don't know, but I don't know how many, but I'm going to show you the third case. 20 year old female college student presented to the eye in cardio respiratory arrest. Experienced seizure while attending party at a local nightclub. 
Lab, serum sodium 122, serum potassium triple one. Chest egg right show massive pulmonary edema. This is the brain and this is the chest. College a student, one of the best universities in the United States, 22. And unfortunately, this is the phase of ecstasy associated hyponatremia. Extremely common in the United States, and I think in Europe, extremely common in the youngs. And most likely, the mechanism is a combination of several mechanisms. You have an increase in ADH, directly an effect of ecstasy. You have an increase in urine osmolarity. You exercise your dancing. They usually, in these clubs, increase the temperature, and they give you water. They give you bottles of water for you to drink. You have nausea and vomiting, and you have accumulation in the GI. And unfortunately, in this case, the diet, the initial IV fluid was normal setting. Now, I'm going to show you a fantastic paper that was done in the Netherlands. Uh, we wrote an editorial. It's high incident on my hyponatremia in females using ecstasy and ray party. Now, look at this. These are males, these are females. And I want to show you that gender was the biggest predictor of who developed hyponatremic encephalopathy after ecstasy. We're all females, not a single male. And that's a very important point because I said that if you are a female, after a party and you develop hyponatremia, the chance for you to die is significant higher if a physician has no suspicion of that. And basically, hyponatremic encephalopathy is the most serious medical complication. Young females are the highest risk group. Non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema can be the initial presentation in significant of these cases. And I can tell you, if you don't treat these people in the ER, immediately they usually die. If you see somebody like that, you draw blood, you don't send this patient for imaging, you just give him 100 cc of hypertonic setting. Because 100 cc of hypertonic setting will not do harm, but can establish a gradient for you to start relieving the cerebral edema. Case four. 32 year old female will collapse after completing a marathon. Decreased level of consciousness, shortness of breath, and nausea. Serum sodium 125, serum potassium 3.2, again, pulmonary edema. And this is a study that we published in the annals in 2000 in Houston. Seven marathon runners who presented an emergency room with a combination of pulmonary edema and hyponatremia. Six survived with hypertonic setting, one died. The wife of a doctor who refused absolutely that will not accept hypertonic setting for pulmonary edema. Patient died, massive cerebral edema, and that's the problem. The problem is, and this is the illustration of the case that survived. This is the initial case, this is the brain, and when you treat the cerebral edema, the pulmonary edema resolves completely. And why is the mechanism? Well, I'm going to explain in a minute, but I want to give a message that in healthy marathon runners, non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema can be associated with hyponatremic encephalopathy condition may be fatal, and this condition can be successfully treated with hypertonic setting. Again, the two more common conditions that can present at the R with pulmonary edema and hyponatremia are ecstasy and exercise-induced hyponatremia, both totally reversible with the use of hypertonic setting. And this is what is not now thanks to the critical care people as aeus Erif syndrome, in which increased brain edema, 
Increase endocranial pressure produce neurogenic pulmonary edema, non-cardiogenic. It's very well established in the literature that any type of increased intracranial pressure can lead to neurogenic pulmonary edema. In our case, we first describe in hyponatremia. The problem is when you develop neurogenic pulmonary edema, you develop hypoxemia. And hypoxemia impairs further brain adaptation. This is a vital circle. And unless you correct the brain edema with hypertonic saline, you don't treat the syndrome. The key is to treat the brain edema to resolve the pulmonary edema. And these are the risk factors for hyponatremic encephalopathy, acute hyponatremia, decreased time for brain adaptation, children, increased ratio to brain intracranial volume, female sex, as we described before, estrogen inhibits brain adaptation, increased AVP levels, cerebral vasoconstriction, hypoperfusion, all impair brain adaptation, hypoxemia impairs brain adaptation, and brain injury. This is important. Anybody who has a persistent brain abnormality like tumor or, 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 or an injury, and you develop hyponatremia as a risk for the, for the worsening. Now, let's talk about what you guys want to know. Treatment of hyponatremia, do we have the evidence? Well, again, this is the same paper in JAMA, and I want to illustrate the problem with a small correction of hyponatremia. If this was a prospective study in the elderly in patients with hyponatremic encephalopathy. And they were at the discretion of the treating physicians either to use hypertonic saline immediately or to fluid restriction. 14 patients in the group with fluid restriction with a correction around six milliequivalents in the first 48 hours all died, 100%. If you treat the patient before they have a respiratory problem, they have 100% survival, no neurologic bad outcome. But if, you, if the patient has a respiratory arrest or, or seizure, even if you treat it, they got bad outcome. What is the message of this? That in hyponatremic encephalopathy, you better treat it early, with enough hypertonic saline. Remember, this was only in patients in which we have evidence of severe encephalopathy, was not a compared to see what type of rate was, but it was, was, was a signal at that time. The second paper that I want to mention is again from the New England in 1987. It shows again that if the correction that you keep in the initial period is less than 20 milliequivalents in the first 48 hours, you universally do well and you have no problem compared to people who correct more than 25. Now, everybody now after this began to really worry about the demilinetic syndrome and hyponatremia. And I want to pose two questions to you and to the audience. What do you think, how common is this? And is rapid correction of risk factor? That is the issue. Well, let's talk about the evidence. Around 29,000 patients since 2015 up to 23 has been published with enough evidence to look to see the degree of hyponatremia and what happened with the correction. In all these cases, it was one case out of 412, eight cases out of 1,490, 12 cases out of 22,858, zero cases out of 1,024 patients, seven cases out of 3,274. And these are all the reference going from 2015 to 2023, which include three patients, three papers, I'm sorry, in 2023, Journal of Critical Care and the two papers in the New England. 
Now, the answer is that demilinetic syndrome and hyponatemia is extremely rare, 0.09%. It's extremely uncommon. But more important, when you look all the cases, and I urge you, you to guide to look the paper, it's unrelated to rapid correction. In fact, you can have cases in which it was never correction of hyponatemia and the patient developed C uh, ODS or CPM. Now, what are the risk factors for this? We think that if you suffer an epoxic anoxic episode prior to the correction, you're at risk for the demilinetic syndrome. In fact, we have animal studies, I'm happy to discuss, if you, uh, that in an animal study where you subject to normal atremic animal to an epoxic episode, they develop in the brain lesion identical to CPM. However, if you increase the serum sodium to hypernatremic level, that's another significant risk factor. If the delta is more than 25 in the first 48 hours, but I can tell you the most important factor is alcoholism. In fact, the original disease was described by Adams in Arca and Neurology in 1957 in five patients at Boston City Hospital with CPN, with, this, with all our colleagues, none with hyponatic. Means alcoholism is a significant risk factor independent of any correction to develop this condition. Now, unfortunately, unfortunately, when we wrote the editorial, was an incredible amount of uh, controversy, which triggers your, your invitation, when we said, we only said, hyperatemic guidelines, have they gone too far? And I believe they did. They went too far because number one, we're not evidence-based, we're opinion-based, and they were restricted. The common individual in the United States is afraid to treat hyperatremia and is afraid to use hypertonic setting. That is the end result of these restrictions. And basically, we decided to do the study with my friends at Harvard, which I was very uh, humbled to participate. But all the study was done there. They should take all the credit, especially this young physician, Dr. Shetepari. It's terrific guy. But are two independent, two independent now, uh, basically studies. One in Journal of Critical Care and one in the New England. That clearly shows that when you compare to six to ten mil equivalents in twenty four hours, which is what the guideline recommend, a correction greater than ten mil equivalents in 24 hours was associated with significant lower in hospital mortality and a 30-day mortality, short length of stay, and multivariate analysis in two studies with two with 4,298 patients. Now, is that a study the best? No, they are not randomized. But my question is, is this, can you guys of anybody show me in a study comparing a slow correction of hyponatemia, less than six mil equivalents to rapid correction, that the mortality is better. In other words, I, 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 I please, I, I ask the audience, I ask you guys, go back to the literature, find me one study, any study in the literature showing that a slow correction is better than a rapid correction. And if it's not that study, which I, I'm sure is not, we review that, why in the hell are we question everything which is not perfect, the rapid correction is better? And that is my question. Why are we using something that is opinion-based against evidence? Now, this is what I propose as trimeral hyponatremic encephalopathy evidence-based. Hypertonic bolus, we introduced that concept in the New England several years ago, a marathon runner, between 100 and 150. Given to peripheral IV, don't, no need to use a central light. Clearly, you can give it. No need for formulas. We can talk about that. That, that is inappropriate. 
and can give it outside the ICU setting. Uh, we calculated uh, 260 kilogram bolus over 10 minutes. We can repeat one or two times as needed. The goal is to five to six meter equivalents increase in serum sodium in the first one to two hours and recheck serum sodium bolus every two hours. And these are the reference, especially the important paper from JAMA Internal Medicine from the Korean, which clearly show that the bolus is the best treatment for hyponatremic encephalopathy. Now, when do we stop treatment? When the patient is awake, alert, responding to command. And I see it sometimes with three, four, five equipment, the patient is getting better, I stop. If the patient has an acute risk of 10 mil equivalent in the first five hours, and we never correct more than 15, 20 mil equivalents in the first 48 hours. Now, there are all the options for correction of hyponatremia, Vactams and urea. I favor urea. I think a doctor of the co from Belgium uh, has shown convincingly that it's a good way to treat these people. It's cheaper over the Vactam, which are extremely expensive, at least in the United States. And sometimes it's highly unpredictable how are they going to respond. Now, I want to finish by saying that hyponatremia is a multi system disease. It's not only the brain, as we talked about before, but it's the lung and it's the bone. Hyponatremia induces apoptosis. And means you need to treat hyponatremia because when you look at any type of hyponatremia as a comorbidity factor in many diseases, treatment of hyponatremia is beneficial. And I thank you for your attention. I hope for questions. Thank you. So very, very thank you, Professor Ayus, for this wonderful talk. And um, I think not only we, but also our viewers will feel the flame and the enthusiasm that you have uh, in the field. And it reminds me on um, of Sir Charles Popper, who said the real scientist should be a brave guy, although he will never reach the real truth. But um, you're really an idol for us. Um, and yeah, we'll skip to uh, Gregor Lindner, who is a, also an emergency physician, um, saw a lot of such cases that you already have presented. Gregor, please. Thank you very much, Marcus. Thanks, Professor Ayers, for this very inspiring talk. In fact, um, I do have a question concerning the correction rates. It was recepted quite controversial, as you said before, but... Would you say that we should focus more on the risk factors for ODS than on the plain correction rates in correcting these patients? Excellent question. Excellent. You're absolutely correct. In other words, number one, I think ODS is a misnomer. And the reason I said it's a misnomer because implied in a small gradient. And you can have patients in which the hyponatemia never existed or the hyponatemia was never corrected, and the patient developed OBS. The number one risk factor is if you are a drunk, I'm sorry, if you are an alcoholic. I see it all the time. I see it all the time. Now, if you have an, if you're an alcoholic, if you are a malnourished, if you have hypokalemia, if you have hypomagnesemia, all these are risk factors. But unfortunately, unfortunately, people are focused about this five to six, seven, and, and let me tell you, I get these legal cases all the time. And in the United States, if you get sued, your life is being destroyed. And I believe that that is wrong, is to profit by the misery of a, of a, of a fellow physician. And, and, and my job is now to expand the concept that having this idea that going to seven mil equivalents or eight mil equivalents produce brain damage is nonsense. If you're an alcoholic, that's a different, I don't know how to treat an alcoholic, I really don't. Now, the New England paper, however, did a very important analysis in this high risk group. And the patient with congestive heart failure, 
and the patient with liver cirrhosis. And guess what? The correction rate in these people, when they go higher, they were better. Means read the paper. This is very convincing. Means I think if we had the best evidence, so or, or the randomized, which by the way, it's going to be very difficult now to convince an ethic committee to have a, a different group of patients to the slow versus rapid when you really have evidence from 5,000 patients in which rapid correction is better. Because you don't have evidence that a slow correction is better. I, I, please, if you find an article, and I will be terrific, I think you need to have your own experience. You, you have to really do, but your point is very well taken. I think the, the, the risk factor is significantly more important than rate of correction. Thank you. So what do you think will be now the consequences um, generally, not even in the US, but also worldwide? So could there be a polarization on the one hand, a less fair um, attitude? And on the other hand, yes, this is a nice study and nice observations, but we will stick to the low correction rate. Uh, very important point that you make. Uh, you know, I, I grew up in Argentina. I, I don't like populistic things. I like to go with evidence. You know, there's a paper already being published by C. Jason now that I have, you know, 20 people said stick with the old things. I don't go with the popularity contest. What I do, I'm a scientist, I'm a basic physiology. Let the evidence go through. And if we are wrong, I think I, I challenge you, uh, my German colleagues. Go and find out. You can you have a great, you know, institutions in Germany or Austria. Repeat the study. See what happened in your own backyard. Prove it's wrong. I know there's going to be, you know, and that's it. I think eventually good science go slowly. Charlatans will go faster. Good science goes slowly. Mm -hmm. I believe that this study will be repeated and will prove us either wrong or right. But at the present time, all the studies so far, I'm telling you so far, suggest rapid correction is not deleterious, rapid correction does not produce ODS, and rapid correction compared to slow correction is better for the survival. And, they, and that's what it is. Is, is it definite? I don't know. Are they gonna jump? I don't know. But I'm not looking for changes. I'm looking for evidence. I don't know if answers, but but that's the way to. But please, you guys are young. I see everybody young there. Go ahead and repeat the study and see what happened. Yeah, yeah, there are, I completely agree. I think although the ODS is rare, I could envision that it's technically possible if, for example, centers would, on the one hand, do a yeah, per protocol um, correction rate and other centers to the fast correction rate as you proposed it. And I think there could be indeed um, thousands of patients be enrolled if a whole center is committed to only one strategy and this could be randomized, I think. So this is possible, I think. Um, and on the other hand, I think what 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 you tell regarding the evidence, it's it's more of a psychological phenomenon because we, we, were, we, were, we were already told in the medical school this nice fitting story um that uh, too rapid correction and that has ingrained and is tattooed so to say in our brain um is potentially hazardous and dangerous and so it's very uh unlikely to get it out of our head now so this is a psychological problem and we have we have this there are several similar things in our field for example it has been shown that statins uh, reduce the cardiovascular risk. And as it has been shown and demonstrated on dialysis patients that there's a null effect, there was uh, looking uh, several years thereafter what is the prescription rate, and it didn't change at all, despite there was the evidence from a randomized trial that there was no any kind of advantage for the dialysis patients. So I think it's more a psychological thing now, and, and it's, it's one has to be like you, with a lot of uh, enthusiasm and fortitude and bravery to to keep moving on and say, hey, we, we do not have 
really good evidence um, for the what the guidelines say. And then if you at least uh, say there are guidelines, everybody becomes a little bit frightened to, to be against the guidelines, even if they are only opinion based. You know, there are a lot of disadvantages when you get an old. A lot of, I can tell you, for personal experience. But one advantage is, do you have seen a lot of things in your life? And you guys are all young, and you will see that things in medicine move very slowly. And, it, and it's a good thing, because you again, you don't want a, a charlatan coming with a magic formula. However, the issue of hyponatremia is like a, something I never understood. I've been treated this for 50 years. I've seen this complication happens, but now you have patient, doctors who call me and say, no, no, in the emergency room, I don't want to give a hypertonic setting. It's going to produce brain damage. That is, the, that is a bad message. That is a horrible message illustrated for this case. You know, this, this is the first lady, imagine if it's your wife or your daughter, Mm -hmm. Come to the hospital for something elective, and they call you is dead. And when you review the case, you go, my gosh, this case, yeah, you give it 200 cc of normal hypertonic center will be alive. Uh, and it's, and it's the, I don't fault the physician. When somebody writes these guidelines, you need to question who authority you have, because who, who, who are these guys decide we are going to be the experts? Who, who, what are the evidence? What type of, you go to the European evidence, which, you know, was published in the big journals, it's all case report. It's not a randomized study because it was not a randomized study. My question was, now that we have this evidence for a large number of patients, why will not at least, at least make an effort to question that? Not to change it, but to open the conversation. The fact that we have this meeting today, to me, is very refreshing because that means that intelligent people have begun to say, well, wait a minute, maybe this guy has some evidence. Let, I want to hear him. And to me, that's, a, that's an improvement. It's going to be slow, but it's an improvement. Yeah, completely agree. But maybe uh, I, I wasn't so aware about this point. You uh, fortunately talked about the balanced solution, about Ringer Lactate. Which is a hypotonic solution, and, and the saline became about ten years ago a very bad credit based on retrospective studies inducing metabolic acidosis and bad outcomes after surgery. Now we have the data. So, is there a correlation with the widespread use of this balanced solution that more of hyponatremia occurs in the hospitals? Well, fascinating question. Again, now let's think for a moment. Let's think for a moment. Uh, Ringer, when you look at the concentration of sodium in the aqueous phase of the plasma, the aqueous phase of the plasma, do the calculation. It's 154. It's 154. Do the calculation. Do the math when we finish. Do the 154. That means the only solution that is physiological at the capillary level is normal saline. Anything else. It's hypotonic, and especially ring and lactate under 30. Now, when we wrote the editorial, when you, the review article for the New England, I can tell you this was incredible to have people asking questions so basic, the reviewers, they didn't understand that. Finally, the editor said, no, no, you're right. Let's do it. My point is, if we want to use ring and lactate, just be aware. I don't be aware. There's a hyponatremic solution. And if you give enough, you can produce hyponatremia. That's that's the only thing I can tell you. They are using this as a number one solution in the United States that is to show without evidence, because all the studies, randomized study, except from the study from Vanderbilt, show that is no advantage in terms of acute renal failure or anything between balanced solution and normal saline. It's a study in JAMA, it's a study in New England, and it's the meta-analysis in the New England. Now, after I said that, it's one disadvantage if you use 
plasma lake in patient who has CNS involvement. Because in that patient, even a minor change in serum sodium can precipitate a bad outcome. The only evidence to suggest balanced solution is better if you're going to use an incredible amount of fluid in a septic patient. But in that case, I would favor plasma light and no ring of lactate. My point with ring of lactate is be aware it's a hyponatremic solution, and at least in the United States, anesthesiologists love the solution. I, I wasn't aware. I always regarded uh, 0.9 saline as a hypotonic. It's, a, it's, a, it's an isotonic solution. It's the only isotonic solution that you can use if you measure sodium and aqueous phase of the capillary, what makes sense, you know, the rest, because in a plasma leader, you have 7% of, of, of solid, means the aqua phase is the aqua, the important phase in, in, in the tonicity. And when yeah. you do the calculation, you come out with 154, yeah. Okay. Well, maybe a, maybe a comment on this. Um, I, do. I, I fully I fully agree with you, and it is also mentioned in the books by Burton Rose and Mitch Helperin that the the sodium contact in the plasma water is one hundred and fifty two to one hundred and fifty four. That's totally correct. And in terms of the pure sodium content of water uh, of of zero point nine saline, you can call it physiologic. But I think you have two different fields here because in terms of the chloride content it is by no means physiologic and i think a second point is that the modern balanced solutions that we use especially here in europe uh, the sodium content is not 132 anymore it's 148 so it's way higher and we do have of course it's not the best evidence but we do have some evidence that it has metabolic effects if you use large numbers of 0.9 saline so i think it's well it can be justified to use modern balanced solutions with a higher sodium content as maintenance fluids i think we have to distinguish between pure sodium content and the whole bottle you know what i mean Absolutely, I completely agree with you. Great question. Thank you for your comment. Let me go back to the problem in the chloride. Uh, how does this thing come in with the chloride? You are you absolutely correct. The concentration uh, of chloride is, is unphysiological and normal saline. Now, the issue of the hyperchloremia decreased cere uh, uh, renal perfusion which is one of the side effects. You know, the study, what are the evidence? It's a study published in the animal model in 12, one to 12 dogs by uh, a good physiology who shows that when you infuse normal saline in the dog model, you have a decrease of perfusion. Now, if you're telling me that you have in Europe uh, this uh, balanced solution 148, that's great. That's terrific. I have no problem in using that. It's more expensive, however, than the hospital people watch in the United States. At least in, I'm talking about the United States. I'm not talking about it. In, 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 in the United States, when we try to change that or when the people, they say, no, we're going to stick because it's more expensive. My problem is with ring the lactate. I have no problem whatsoever with plasma light 148. My problem is over being a lactate. And the only problem is that many people are not cognitive to the issue of ring lactate be hyponatremic solution. Now, after you look into the, the evidence, do you agree that all the studies except the one study, which was no randomized, suggest there was no difference between balanced solution and, and normal saline? at least the two studies in the New England and the study from Brazil and JAMA, except for people who receive large amount of fluids and sepsis was no, was no yes. different. Okay. I agree. If you have, if you have no difference uh, and you have a problem with the cause, you can go anyway, but you are absolutely correct and your point is well taken. Yes. I agree. But what I said is there are patient populations who are in need of large uh, fluid volumes. And there I should, I, I should really think that 
these balanced solutions have a justification. That's that's what I mean. Oh, absolutely. You're absolutely, absolutely correct. I have no problem. You are using the solution. My problem is with ring and lactate. It's absolutely valid point. Yes. Maybe one final question from me, uh, Gregor, and, and we are now uh, doing the, so to say, guidelines or recommendations for treating hyponatremia in Austria. So when it comes now to, to the point of, of this correction rate, so would there be an advice? Should we um, yeah, simply take what you already have done in your fantastic talk that we look at the characteristics of, of the patients who might get ODS and uh, simply kick away these six to eight millimoles um, increase in sodium? What would, would be your yeah, advice? That's <laughs> We are in the final phase now of the guidelines. No, I, I, will, I, I will, I'm sorry, I will have to stick to my guns and what other studies shows. I'm convinced that it, what I completely convinced that less than six is very dangerous. It's very dangerous. Now you can argue 10 in 24 hours, then, but I would say if you, if you want to get something from me, I would say if you go less than six in a symptomatic patient, you're exposing your patient to a significant risk of mortality. That, that I absolutely convinced. That I look up. Now, after I said that, I want to remind you why are these people missing the point? Now, in a normal brain, if you take a, 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 with the old animal study, if you produce an animal and you induce cerebral edema, and the animal is with normal oxygen, that animal will respond to water movement with a small increase in tonicity. In other words, you will see a decrease. We have done MRI studies by increasing two, three millicalories, you see a movement. However, if you take that animal, you put it in a chamber, hyponatremic animal, and the animal becomes epoxy, you need a gradient that is higher. And why is that? Because when you have epoxia, the sodium ATP span is impaired. And that movement to favor extrusion of water is impaired. That means if you got somebody who has already having is a female, has something that impaired volume regulation, that is the type of patient that probably needs a higher gradient of correction. I don't know if I answer your question. Let me have to put it in context. But I, I, if you want to give for me to give you a bottom line, I think going less than six equivalents in the initial period in somebody symptomatic, to me, at the present time, is inappropriate. Thank you. That's very valuable. I have two final questions, actually. So the first one is, do you have ready to use 3% sodium chloride solutions for your emergency rooms? Because we don't have them here in Germany. I don't know about Austria. And so they have to prepare them for each patient at the ER. So are there pre-prepared 3% solutions in the States? And the second question, who are those people who develop exercise-induced hyponatremia? Are those those uh, who have uh, very uh, strong pain during running and drink too much fluids or who can be identified to be at particular risk? Uh, excellent question. Let me tell you what. No, in the United States, we have the solution already uh, done. It's, it's preformed. And you have no... Now, now, sometimes you have to fight because until recently, I would say a couple of years ago, they demand many hospitals that in order for you to use hypertonic setting, you need to put the patient in the ICU and put a central line. Nonsense. Absolutely nonsense. Fortunately, after our papers, other people prove that you can use it in the emergency room to a peripheral IV. No question about it. Means we have no problem, and you should convince your pharmacy to have the solution available. Why I said that? Because if you see somebody like ecstasy associated hyponatremia, which you will see it presented to the emergency room with pulmonary edema, 
If you don't treat that individual immediately, these people will die. And that is a serious, serious problem. Now, who develop uh, hyponatremia after marathon? Are they usually females? They're usually people who run slowly, and they're usually people who drink a lot of water and, and take non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs for pain, combination of four things. How do you identify this? Because when we have this type of people, it's very simple. You, you have a guy who basically will tell you that he, his, his hands become very swollen. They, they retain water. They drink water, they retain water. And again, in the United States now, we have this 10, this mandatory. All the marathon organizations should have a 10 to attend these people in the field and they use hypertonic selling and there's no more fault, no more deaths. Yes, and the state is very well recommended. Thank you so much. So this was really fascinating. In the last three years, I think we did 150 or even more videos, but I'm quite positive that this may be the one that most directly saved patients' life for all those people who will watch the video in the next weeks, months, and years. So thanks so much for being our Thank guest. Thank you so much, Professor. It was really, uh, you know, they, they said uh, in Hebrew, if you save one patient, if you save one person, you save the world. And, uh, you know, that's, if this result of these years of research can result in people saving you know, one life, I think I fulfill my life. Thank you very much. It was a real honor. I enjoyed the presentation.